स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello everyone this is Dr Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing we were discussing about the living organisms so so far what we have discussed in this course is we have discussed about the classification of the living organisms and then we also discuss about the uh, how these living organisms are related to each other and in that context we have discussed about the many types of evidences what we people have put together to un, to explain that the uh, higher organisms are being evolved from the lower organism and so on and then subsequent to that we have also discussed about the theories which are explaining the evolutions and so on and in the previous lecture we have also discussed about the uh, cellular structures we have discussed about the prokaryotic structure as well as the eukaryotic structures and uh, within the prokaryotic cells we have discussed about the uh, genomic dna we have discussed about the cell wall we have discussed about the many features of the prokaryotic cells and when we were discussing about the eukaryotic cell we have discussed about the different types of membrane bound organelles what are present in that uh, eukaryotic cells so we discuss about the nucleus we discuss about the uh, mitochondria chloroplast golgi bodies the organelles which are in, important for the vesicular trafficking such as the endoplasmic reticulums golgi bodies lysosomes and then we also discuss about the plasma membranes and while we were discussing about these organelles we have also discussed not only we, we have not only discussed about the structures of these organelles we have, we have also discussed about the function of these organelles for the cell but while we were discussing about these functions we have already uh, always been talking about the different types of biomolecules which are participating into the different types of functions for example when we are talking about the vesicular trafficking we 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 have said that the vesicular trafficking is being done by the various type of the uh, tags or signals right so all these tags and signals are nothing but the biomolecules so in this module and as well as in the subsequent module we are going to start discussing about the biomolecules so let's start about discussing about the biomolecules so when we say about the biomolecules the biomolecules the name suggests that these are the molecules which are going to be present into the biological system and they are actually going to have their specific function so these are the molecules which are present in the biological system and they are actually going to have some specific functions so uh, when we say uh, uh, biomolecules uh, we are only going to talk about the some of the uh, macromolecules or some of the important biomolecules so if you see about the uh, organisms or the living cell they are actually having the four different types of biomolecules which are actually been participating into the different types of reactions so we have the dna or the rna and the function of the dna and rna is that they are actually going to carry the genetic informations mostly the dna is is, is present in the form of the genomic dna or the genome of that particular organism there are exceptions where the dna instead of dna we have the rna as well uh, as as well as the genomic dna 
and then the RNA is actually a molecule which actually carry the information from the uh, from the DNA and that is how it is helps in the protein synthesis. Uh, that anyway we are going to discuss when we are going to discuss about the uh, some of the uh, processes uh, biological processes such as the replication, transcription and translations. So, that time we are going to discuss in detail about the role of the DNA and RNA. Similarly, we have the lipid molecules and if you remember when we were in the previous lecture when we were talking about the cellular media, we said that the lipids are required for the energy production because the lipids are being oxidized under the beta oxidations and the lipids are the molecules which are formed by the uh, submission of the glycerol and the fatty acids and then they go under the fatty acids actually go under the beta, beta oxidations and that is how they are actually going to produce the large quantity of energy. Apart from that the lipids are also being an uh, integral part of the plasma membrane so they are also being considered as the building blocks. Uh, then we, we have also discussed about the carbohydrates. So, carbohydrates when we are talking about the preparation of the media, we have also discussed about the carbohydrates like we said that the gluco the, uh, the media also has the carbohydrates such as the glucose or the sugar and the carbohydrates main job is that it is actually been functional as the energy metabolism or to the energy production. So, glucose is being metabolized within the glycolysis and as well as uh, uh, as well as the Krebs cycle and that is how it is actually going to produce large quantity of the ATP and that ATP is going to be utilized by the cell for several type of functions. Apart from that the carbohydrates are also being present as the uh, as a signal molecules in some of the cells for example the carbohydrates are present on to the RBC and these carbohydrate molecules are actually giving forming the different types of antigens and that is how the, carbo the RBCs could actually adopt the different types of blood groups right. So, you can have the different types of blood groups because of the uh, sugar uh, modifications right. So, we what are the different blood groups? We have the four different types of blood groups. We have the A, we have the B, so we have the AB right and we have the O antigens. So, in the A we have the A antigens, in the B we have the B antigen, in the AB we have the A and B both antigens and in the O we do not have any type of antigens. So, the, the difference between these antigen is that it has a protein which is being modified by the uh, carbohydrate molecules. Then, then we come back to the proteins. So, in the proteins we have the proteins are made up of, of the uh, constituents amino acids and the proteins have a very very uh, is, is having a huge role in terms of as the building blocks. So, protein are actually being present in the plasma membrane, proteins are the structural proteins uh, like for example in the humans humans are actually being able to walk or stand because they have a protein which is called as the collagen right. So, because of this uh, collagen fibers uh, the uh, the humans are could be able to stand and walk because the most of the bones are made up of, of the collagen fibers. Then uh, it also has the enzymes. So, these enzymes are actually participating into the different types of reactions whether these reactions are the detoxification reactions what is happening in the liver such as the, the enzyme which are involved in the cytochrome C uh, oxidase pathway or there are enzymes which are important for the neutralization of the some of the toxic molecules. Apart from that the enzymes are also being utilized in catalyzing the conversion of the substrate into the product and that is how they are actually going to shuttle the different types of constituents between the different pathways. And the enzymes are also been participating into the different types of metabolic reactions. If you remember we have talked about the glycolysis and grape cycles which are actually important for the energy production especially uh, and also the beta oxidations. Uh, 
all these oxidative pathways uh, we are actually been using the enzyme as the driving forces and that's how the the proteins are important for as a building blocks proteins are important as an enzyme and protein is important for the metabolism and that's why if you want to understand the cellular activities or if you want to understand the cellular functions it is important to understand the uh, structure as well as the functions of these uh, important biomolecules. So today we are going to start with the nucleic acids and with the nucleic acid we are going to understand about its structure and we are also going to start understand about the uh, important functions and uh, when we uh, because uh, as I said you know in our subsequent uh, modules we are actually going to discuss about the functions in detail where we are going to talk about the replication transcription and translation so those detail functions we are going to take up and the mechanism as well into those particular modules. So let's start our discussion and we are going to start with the nucleic acids. Nucleic acid, uh, the nu most of the organisms like whether it is the prokaryotic organism or the eukaryotic organisms has DNA as the genetic material whereas the minor fractions such as the viruses has RNA as a genetic material. So nucleic acid is uh, important because it is a genetic material and uh, what is present in the cell right uh, the mostly the the genetic material is dna right whether it is the prokaryotic or the eukaryotic cell but in some cases the uh, like for example the uh, viruses you have the viral uh, rna as a genetic material but even then the when the viruses have the rna as a genetic material that rna get converted into the dna when the virus is entering into the cell and that's how it actually propagates within the host as a dna molecule uh, so uh, so in most of the cases the dna is going to be the genetic material and in some cases the rna is also going to be a genetic material a DNA or the RNA, uh, whether it is DNA or the RNA is a, bi a biopolymer and it is acidic in nature. It is acidic in nature because it had the uh, 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 gro groups like that. In eukaryotic cells, whether it is the animal cell or the plant cell, the nucleic acid is present within the nucleus, right, that we have already discussed, right, is it the, the DNA is present inside the nucleus. The nucleus is a double membrane structure which has the uh, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear membranes and the other kinds of structures whereas in the prokaryotic cells it is present in the free form into the cytosol. The first nucleic acid was isolated by the Frederick Matcher in the year of 1868 uh, and since then the people know about the nucleic acids. Now the first question comes is how we know that that genetic material is that nucleic acid is is the genetic material so how we know right because we have the three candidates right we have the nucleic acid right we have the nucleic acid uh, which can be a genetic material or it can be a protein because earlier people were thinking that the protein could be a genetic material rather than the nucleic acid because new protein is actually a functional molecule so it can be do lot of functions so people were under the impression that the protein could be the functional molecule so that could be actually carrying the information from the one generation to another generation and that's how it could be that could be the genetic material because the purpose of the genetic material is that it is actually going to carry the information information from the one generation to the next generations. So then people have started uh, doing the uh, you know classical experiments. There are many experiments what the scientists have done. We have the, we have a classical experiment which is being done by the Hershey or Chase and uh, we have also experiment by the Everty and we also have the experiment which is done by the Griffith. So what I am going to talk about the Griffith's experiments. So the, what Griffith has done, right? So Griffith was a scientist, uh, and he has performed an experiment in the year of 1928, where what he has done is he has taken a mice, 
and he has taken the two strains of the streptococcus pneumonia so that streptococcus pneumonia is causing a disease which is called as pneumonia right so pneumonia is a lung infection right so it's a lung infection disease and it is actually uh, uh, lethal right so if it is not been treated right because it is going to destroy the lungs and that's how the person will not be able to take the uh, respirations so what he has done is he has taken the two different strains of this uh, streptococcus pneumonia strain uh, one strain which is called as this S strain which causes the disease and the death of the mice. So it has he has taken the two strain one the S strain which is actually causing the disease and it is actually going to kill the mice. So that is a uh, virulent strain. Then he has taken another strain which is called R strain and R strain is a avirulent strain and it is not been able to cause the disease. So it will not be going to cause the death of the mice. So avirulent strain, so R is avirulent strain, right? Uh, so what he has done is for initially he has tested whether the this fact is true or not. So what he has done is he has taken the four set of mice. In the first set of mice, he has injected the uh, live strain. So what he has done is he have cultured these strains uh, into a, a, into a uh, culture vials, and then he has injected those strain into the mice. And what he could found is that the mice are dead because they might have developed the pneumonia, and that's how the mice were dead. Then what he has done is he also tested whether the R strain is also good or not. So what he has done is he has taken the R strain, he cultured those strain and then he injected the R strain into the mice. And uh, what could find is that the mice could not be able to develop the disease and he was uh, live. So that's what he has tested and by these two experiments he tested the fact that the S strain is actually virulent strain and the R strain is a avirulent strain. Then what he has done is he has actually uh, cultured the virulent strain and then before injecting the bacteria to the mice, he has heat killed them. So once you heat kill them, you are actually going to kill the protein part, right? So you are actually going to destroy the proteins, right? You are actually going to destroy the protein so when you try the proteins, you could not be able to cause the disease. So it could not be able to cause the disease because the, uh, the genomic DNA was, uh, so it, it could be able to kill the protein and as well as the DNA, right? So it could be, could not cause the disease. So when he heat killed the bacteria, that bacteria could not be able to transfer the genetic material or it could not be able to grow and that's how he could be able to cause the uh, he could not be able to cause the disease. Now what he has done is he has first heat killed the virulent strain. So he got the heat killed the virulent strain and then he, he mixed those uh, virulent killed virulent strain and he has injected uh, and he has mixed that with the a virulent strain. And when he has injected those mixture, right, when he injected the mixture of the virulent strain and the heat kill at strain, what he could found is that he could found the death of the mice. So what he found, I could, uh, he could be able to conclude that there is a factor uh, which is response which were present in the S strain and that factor was transferred to the R strain and that's how the R strain got converted into S strain and that's how when the R strain he is injecting the R strain on its own he could not be able to kill the mice but when he is heat killed the virulent strain that is not causing the death but when he has mixed the uh, uh, these heat killed mice and he could inject that into the uh, into the mice, he could found that the mice are dead. So this you can ignore, this is just a wrong uh, drawing actually. So when mice are injected with the non virulent strain and the heat killed virulent strain, they die. Type 2 bacteria wrapped in the type are recovered from the these mice. So uh, by doing this experiment, the Griffith has, ex uh, has concluded that there is a 
factor which is genetic factor and that genetic factor is nothing but the DNA uh, what was being transferred uh, from the S strain to the R strain and that is how the R strain has also acquired the, the phenotype of the S strain and that is how when he has injected the mixture it could be able to lead to the death of the mice. So, by doing this experiment and we have couple of more experiments which people have done like Hershey Chase experiments and uh, Abertis experiment that also prove that the DNA is the genetic material. So, what is the composition of the nucleic acids? So, nucleic acid is composed of the three components. You have the phosphoric acid and because of that only the nucleic acid is having the acid like uh, properties, right. Uh, then you also require the base. So, these are the um, uh, nitrogenous base and then you also require the sugar. The phosphoric acid provides the backbone to the polymer whereas sugar work as the anchoring point for the nitrogenous base. The nine membered uh, nitrogenous base gives the diversity into the sequence of the nucleic acids. So, we have the phosphate backbone. So, phosphoric acid serves as the backbone of the molecule. So, this is the phosphoric acid what you see it is actually serving as a backbone. So, what you see here is the four, the four points and these points are actually uh, mixing it with the sugar and that is how it is actually uh, anchoring the uh, anchorage point and then the sugar is working as an anchorage point for the nitrogenous bases. And then we have the sugar. So, we have the five membered cyclic reducing sugar present in the nucleic acid. There are two different variants. The sugar molecules which contains the hydroxy group at the three prime are known as the ribose sugar and it is present and it is known uh, or otherwise it is known as the deoxyribose. So, you can have the two different types of sugars. You can have the ribose sugar or the deoxyribose sugar. So, what is the difference in the ribose sugar at the 3 prime uh, at, the, at the 3 prime as well as at the 2 prime you are going to have the hydroxyl groups. So, and because of that this is called as the ribose sugar or the uh, and whereas in the case of deoxyribose sugar that 2 prime OH is actually missing and that is how it is called as the deoxyribose sugar. The ribose sugar is present in the RNA whereas the deoxyribose sugar is present in DNA. Based on the sugar the nucleic acid is classified as the RNA or the DNA. The ribose sugar is present in RNA whereas the deoxyribose is present in DNA. The purpose of the sugar in the nucleic acid to provide the attachment point for the nitrogenous bases. So, the, whether it is a ribose sugar or the deoxyribose sugar, the purpose of the sugar molecule is that it is actually going to provide the attachment point for the nitrogenous bases. So, nitrogenous bases are actually going to attach at this point. This OH is actually going to be used in the sugar for attaching the uh, nitrogenous bases. Now, the third component is the nitrogenous bases. So, the nitrogenous bases are there are two different variants the nine membered rings, nine membered conjugated double bond system which are called as the purines such as the adenine and guanine. So, you have the two different types of sugars uh, two, two different types of nitrogenous bases. The nine membered conjugated double bond purines such as the adenine and guanine. So, what you see here is the structure of the adenine and guanine and these are the purines. Uh, similarly, you have the six membered single ring system pyrimidines such as the thymine, uracil and cytosine. Uh, so, this is the three member, a uh, six member ring, a uh, single ring structure. These are double ring structures and in here you have these are the pyrimidines and you have the three pyrimidine molecule sugar uh, the bases you have the thymine, cytosine and uracil. Remember that adenine is actually been labeled or written as A, guanine is written in G, thymine is written as T, cytosine is written as C and uracil is written as U. Okay? The presence of 
denitrogenous bases is predetermined which means it is already been known that which nitrogenous bases are going to be present in the genomic dna or to the dna the dna has the four nucleotides uh, or the four bases which which it has the adenine it has guanine it has thymine and it has a cytosine so guanine it has the adenine and guanine and it has thymine and the cytosine but it does not contain the uracil whereas the rna has the adenine guanine uracil and cytosine and strictly no thymine so remember that in dna you are going to have no uracil right and in the rna you are not going to have the thymine so that you should remember rest all are actually going to be present right now these uh, bases are actually making a pair with each other and uh, the a is making a pair with t whereas g is always making a pair with c so why such a base pair that question is actually very important and that question is we are going to answer when we are going to talk about the base pairing within the a and t and the g and c now let's uh, understand the structure and that also is going to give you the idea about the base pairing so nucleic acid structure so the dna is double stranded whereas rna is single stranded in most of the cases there are there are exceptions where you have the double stranded rna but that is very uh, very few cases where you have the double stranded rna mostly the dna is double stranded whereas rna is single stranded the individual monomer responsible for making dna or rna is called as the nucleotide and as a result the dna or the rna can be considered as the polynucleotide okay so just like you know we have the uh, polymeric sugars we have the uh, we have the fats right polysaturated fats and something like that similarly you can actually call the nucleic acid uh, whether they dna or rna as the polynucleotide because it is actually be a submission of the nucleotide molecules so what is nucleotide the individual nucleotide is a nucleoside attached to the one or more phosphate group and can so what is nucleoside so when you can see here right when the sugar molecule is attached to the base with the help of the glycosidic bond it is actually going to give you give rise to a compound which is known as the nucleoside okay so this is the structure if you have the sugar attached to the uh, base then that is called as the nucleoside okay if it is going to have the phosphate so if you have the phosphate and if that attaches with the sugar and it is attaches with the base then that is called as the nucleotide okay in some cases you can also call it as the nucleoside monophosphate so if it is a one phosphate molecule you can call it as nucleoside monophosphate if it is two phosphate then it will be called as the nucleoside diphosphate and if it is a three phosphate then it is going to be called as the nucleoside triphosphates uh, you can also call it as the nucleotide right so nucleotide could be whether you have the one phosphate group the two phosphate group or the three phosphate groups each nucleoside is composed of the nitrogenous bases attached to the sugar through the glycosidic bond so this this bond is the glycosidic bond which actually links the base to the sugar now once the nucleotides are formed these nucleotides are also going to be arranged in a different fashion right so the nucleotides are having a free hydroxyl group at the 3 prime end right so you see at the free hydroxyl group which is at the 3 prime end whereas it has a phosphate group at the 5 prime of the phosphate so this is a phosphate group at the 5 prime end the first nucleotide has a free phosphate group and the 3 hydroxyl group makes a bond with the phosphate group at the 5 prime of the next nucleotides which means you use this particular group so this is the 5 prime end and this is the 3 prime end so if it is a first uh, nucleotide it is actually going to use this uh, nucleotide uh, the 3 prime uh, OH group and it is actually going to mix with the phosphate molecule of the next and that's how 
it, there will be a propagation. So you can imagine that if you have the A, the A is actually going to have the OH, right? This is the 3 prime OH and then it is actually going to mix with the 5 prime of the next base. So this is like, for example, you have the T, um, sorry, uh, you have the G, right? So that's how it is actually going to propagate. Again, here you are going to have OH, right? So this is the 3 prime end and this one also is going to have the 5 prime, right? So it has going to have a 5 prime phosphate and the 3 prime phosphate is 5 prime or 3 prime OH is actually going to make a bond with the pi prime of the next right and that's how that will continue and that's how it is actually going to make a linear chain. The propagation of the nucleotide along the length of the chain give rise to the polynucleotide. As a result of each polynucleotide chain has a free 5 prime phosphate group and a free 3 prime hydroxyl group. It gives the polarity to the nucleotide chain and it runs in the direction of the 5 prime to 3 prime. So that's why the DNA is always being called as that it is runs in the 5 prime to 3 prime because you can have the first nucleotide as the first this nucleotide and then it actually makes the bond with the subsequent nucleotide and that's how the top nucleotide is actually going to be a 5 prime end and the last nucleotide is actually going to have the 3 prime end and that's why for conventional purposes the DNA is going to be called that it is running in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime. Now DNA is a double stranded where a sing RNA is a single stranded. Both strands of DNA are held together. So, so you are going to have the two strands right in the DNA. So you are going to have a 5 prime end then you are going to have bases like that right and then you, you are going to have the OH which is going to be 3 prime end of that last base. Similarly, you, you are going to have another strand which runs in the reverse direction. So on this side you are going to have the 5 prime end right and then it runs in this direction and it is actually going to have the 3 prime end and that is how there will be a base pairing between the bases what are present onto this particular strands right. So if you have the A it is actually going to make the strands. So the so adenine of the one chain is always making the two hydrogen bonding with the thymine of the next chain. So this is what it is showing. So this is the adenine what has been attached to the one, uh, one chain right. This is the one chain, this is the second chain and the adenine what is attached to the first uh, polymer, a uh, polynucleotide is making a base pairing with the uh, guanine, uh, thymine what is present on to the uh, second chain and that is how it is actually making a two hydrogen bonding with the thymine of the next chain. So you can imagine that it is actually going to make the double bond, double hydrogen bond with the thymine. Similarly, if it is a, having a guanine then it is going to make the three pairs with the cytosine. So similarly, the guanine of one chain is making the three hydrogen bonding with the cytosine of the next chain. So this is what you see here that the DNA is having a double helix structure, right? So it has a double standard structure and where you are actually running one uh, strand in the 5 prime to, so both the strands are running in the 5 prime to 3 prime, right? So one strand is running in the 5 prime to 3 prime directions and the other strand is running in the 5 prime to 3 prime. So for example, this one is actually having a, a 5 prime on this side and the 3 prime on this side. So this actually runs like that. Now again we are going to ask the same question, why such a base pair, why there is a strict rule that A is actually making a pair with T and G is always making a pair with C. The answer is that since we understand now the structure of the DNA, right, we could understand there are two uh, strands, two polynucleotide strands which are making a base pairing. And the structure is also very clear, right? You have a very double helix structures where you have the uh, uh, the width of this structure as the 20 angstrom width, and in one round it actually goes from the 34 angstrom. So that's why the the DNA is actually uh, having a very strict structure in terms of the width and in terms of the places or the distances between the strand, dist distances between the bases. So because of the, this particular type of uh, restrictions, we have a strict base, uh, base pairing between the A and T. You can see that the adenine or the guanine is purine 
and it has a nine membered ring which means it is actually going to be bulky compared to the six membered ring so whereas thymine or the cytosine is a pyrimidine and the six membered ring so adenine uh, like the purines are actually going to be little bulky which means they are actually going to be big right so you see this it has two rings right so it has two rings uh, whereas the uh, whereas the pyrimidine is actually going to be smaller right it's going to be small right compared to the purines so if you keep the two purine molecules for example if you keep a and if you keep the g the purines and purines are actually going to be very wide so they will actually going to have the steric hindrances between the two molecules because you know that the dna runs as a double helical structure so width of this strand is already been fixed right and that width is 20 inch strong so if cannot be accommodate any kind of uh, distortion right so if you have the two bases which is purine and purine the the spaces between them is actually going to so narrow so they will not going to form the bounds and they also not going to accommodate into that and that's why the, the it has been decided that you can have one which is goes like slightly bigger and one one is smaller smaller same is true for if you have the two pyrimidines if you have two pyrimidines they are actually going to have the very narrow so if you have two pyrimidines they are going to be so far away that there will be no hydrogen bonding between them so because of that the we have a consistent base pairing like where one side you can have the purine the other side you can have the pyrimidine the presence of the both purine which are actually having the bulky side chains or the pyrimidine which are going to be small side chain makes it difficult to accommodate or too short to form the hydrogen bonding within the dna strands in addition the purine and pyrimidine has a perfect match of the hydrogen acceptor and the donor site which means if you have the purine and the pyrimidine as the basis not only there will be a, a definite uh, geometry so, so that they can be able to accommodate it into the dna structure they are also having the perfect uh, stereochemistry so that they can have the perfect uh, base pairing so as a strict requirement of the base pairing two chains are complementary to each other which means a is always going to make the pair with t and g is always making a pair with c and because of that if there is a a it is actually always going to be t so that's how this kind of phenomena is called as the complementary which means if you one strand you have a there's no way that you can have the any other residues right? so it can be t only on this side so that's why this phenomena that you have one a so it has to be t on the other side and that that kind of feature is called as the complementary to each other now what what is complementarity means to you what is mean by complementarity it means that if i provide you a sequence of nucleotide on the one strand it will let you to predict very precisely the sequence of the nucleotide on the other strand as i said you know if the one strand you have a the other strand you don't have to tell like you you know that it's actually going to be t if you have the g it is actually going to say that okay it's going to be c if you say it's going to be c then it is going to be g it cannot be a right because just now we have discussed right there is a definite base pairing between the a and t so because of that this is the advantage of being a complementary dna complementary sequences now every appearances of a will actually going to give you the t and every g is actually going to give you the c on the second strand you can see the dna sequence so i have shown you a sequence like so this is the strand one and this is the strand two now even if i don't give you the strand 2 you can be able to generate the sequence of the strand 2 because you everywhere you have the a you can just put the t if you have the t you can just put the a so that's how you can be able to generate the complementary sequence and that is the advantage of having the dna structure as a complementary structures 
the individual strands of the DNA runs in the direction of the 5 prime to 3 prime and the other strands are going to be run in the direction of the 3 prime to 5 prime which means if this is the strand 1 this is actually going to start with the 5 prime of the phosphate. So, it is going to start with the 5 prime phosphate group and then the first uh, base is actually going to use this 3 prime hydroxyl group and it is actually going to make the bonds with the subsequent bases and that is how the last nucleotide is actually going to be end up at the 3 prime hydroxyl group right. Uh, same is true for the strand 2, but the strand 2 is actually going to st uh, strand 2 is actually going to start in the reverse direction. So, this one is running in this direction and this one is running in the this direction. So, you can see the 5 prime group is actually having a, a basis with the uh, uh, is starting from the first base and then from here the it is actually making a basis with the subsequent things. So, that is how you see this is the 5 prime end and this is the 3 prime end. So, that is how the DNAs are actually are running in the complementary sequences and it also are anti parallel in directions. Hence, both the strands are running in the anti parallel direction to maintain the base complementarity. The presence of the complementarity in base pairing and the running of strand in the anti parallel direction allows the precise duplication of the DNA through the replications. So, it has an advantage that the genome of the any uh, organism can be uh, duplicated, can be multiplied without uh, you know going through with the information on to the second strand. For example, if this is strand, so we can actually put the two machineries onto this, right? We can put the two machinery, one machinery on this side and another machinery on this side and that is how this actually can make one copy and this also can make one copy and that is how it is actually going to give you the two copy of DNA, right? And that is the advantage of having a complementary as well as the anti parallel directionality within the DNA structures. Now, the additional advantage is that you can actually be able to use this particular type of base pairing rules and you can be able to calculate even the composition of the DNA. So, uh, so understanding the base pairing required, Chargaff has proposed the rule about the composition of the DNA. The summary of this rule is as follows. The purines and the pyrimidines are always in an equal quantity which means a plus G is equal to C plus T. So, if I give you the amount of G, you can be able to calculate the amount of all other uh, properties. The amount of adenine is equal to the thymine and the amount of cytosine is equal to the guanine, which means and the, why it is so because the A is actually going to make the base pairing with T and G is actually make, going to make a base pairing with T. So, this is 3, three uh, bonds actually. So, that is why if I as I said you know if I tell you okay an organism has 30 percent G okay that means the organism has 30 percent of C actually. So, if it has 30 percent of the C and you know that the total is 100 percent right then this is actually equal to this right. This means if I just put these values into this formula, I could be able to calculate the A as well as the T as well. The base pair ratio that the A plus T by the G plus C may vary from one species to another, but it will remain constant for the given species. So, if you are going to talk about the for example, one species for example, we are, if we talk about the humans. So, humans species is homo sapiens. So, this AT ratio, AT by GC ratio could vary from one organism to another organism because it depends on the complexity of that particular genome, but it could not be vary within the species. So, for example, if I have isolated a DNA uh, and if I do not know the source of this DNA, what I can do is I can just calculate the GC by AT ratio and I can be able to tell that whether it is a human DNA or not because I can actually be able to match that with the um, GC by AT ratio for the human samples, right. 
same is true for the other organism also suppose i got a sample which is uh, you know from the dog or from the cow because this ratio is not going to vary within the species it could vary from the species to species so it is actually a clear identifiers for that particular species and that's how the people are using this kind of analysis in the dna uh, based uh, identification processes he proposed uh, that these ratios can be used to identify the species and classify them that's why the if you see like for example the people are identifying a new bacteria right what they are doing is they are doing this kind of analysis to know whether this bacteria belongs to a existing bacteria what they have in the system or not if it is not then they'll say oh they have identified a new bacteria and then they can be able to classify them and according to some more tools they can be able to put them under the appropriate uh, groups and appropriate uh, class actually the deoxyribose sugar and the phosphate component occurs into the equal proportion so the gnc only varies but the sugar and the phosphate component which are actually the building blocks of the dna or rna is not varying between the two species if the dna is double stranded how it can be denatured to access the information of the nucleotide sequence the so DNA double helix can be break open, right? So do you know that the DNA is a uh, double helix, right? So the question is how actually you can break this DNA so that you can be able to extract this information. DNA can be break open if it is exposed to the high temperature or titrate with the acid or alkali, right? So there are, there are definite treatments which you can do actually. So if you take this DNA and if you heat it, you can be able to break the strands, okay? If you add the acid or if you add the alkali, then also you can be able to break because uh, if you put the acid and alkali, it is actually going to destroy the hydrogen bonding between the uh, bases and that's how it is actually going to get broken. During this process, the hydrogen bonding between the two strand breaks. This process is known as the melting or the denaturations. When the denatured DNA is incubated at low temperature, the separated strand reassociate to form the duplex DNA. This process is known as the renaturation. So you have the denaturations. If you heat up the DNA, then it is actually going to denature. And if you lower down the temperature, it is actually going to come back because you know that A is having a complementary T with the T and G is actually going to make the base pair with C. So that's how they will come together. The denatured, denaturation and renaturation kinetics is used to understand the complexity of the DNA and it has a wide application, wide application in the amplification of the strand using the polymerase chain reactions. Now, once you have understood about the genomic DNA, we can also understand about the isolation of the genomic DNA because then you can be able to you understand how you can be able to utilize this genomic dna for the subsequent reactions like just now we discussed right you can be able to calculate the gc by at ratio and you can be able to identify the species for that purpose you first have to identify the gene uh, was to have to isolate the genomic dna from that particular organisms so if you want to isolate the genomic dna whether it is from the bacteria or whether it is from the uh, eukaryotic cell First step is that you have to break the cells. So you have to lyse the cells with the detergent containing the lysis buffer. So what you have to do is you have to take the cells and you have to incubate it with the lysis buffer. And that what it's going to do is lysis buffer is actually going to lyse the cells. If you are going to start with the uh, tissue, like for example, if you are starting with the liver, then you might have to digest that liver with also with the lysis buffer. Then you incubate incubation of the cell with the digestion buffer containing the proteinase K SDS to release the genomic DNA from the DNA protein complex. Then you incubate that with the enzymatic digestions. That enzymatic digestion is actually having a composition where you have an enzyme which is called as the proteinase K. So that proteinase K is actually going to chew up the protein part. And that's why it is actually going to release the genomic DNA from the DNA protein complex. 
then you isolate the genomic DNA by the absolute alcohol precipitation. So then what you are going to do is you are going to precipitate the genomic DNA with the absolute alcohol and that is actually going to give you the uh, DNA which is still be having a contamination. So what are the contamination you are going to have? You are going to have the contamination of the proteins. You are also going to have the genomic DNA. Now what next topic is or next task is that we should remove the protein part right because we want to have the pure genomic DNA from the cell. So then what we are going to do is we are going to incubate that with the chlorophyll, phenol and isomyl alcohol mixture. So purification of the genomic DNA with the phenol chloroform mixture. So phenol uh, chloroform mixture has two phases. It has the aqueous phase and it has the organic phase. So when you extract the this DNA which contains the protein with the phenol chloroform mixture, it is actually going to give you the two phases. You are going to see the aqueous phase and then you are going to see the organic phase. So what is there in the organic phase? All the proteins are actually going to be come into the organic phase because they will get precipitated whereas the DNA is actually going to be present into the aqueous phase. So now what you have to do is very carefully with the help of the pipette, you have to collect the aqueous phase and you have to put it into the new appendix. And then you have to use the precipitation. So in the step 5, you have to precipitate that with the absolute alcohol and you have to solubilize the DNA into the uh, water and that's how you are going to get the pure genomic DNA. So once you got the pure genomic DNA, you can be able to run that onto the agarose gel uh, and then it's actually going to give you a band. So what you see here, this white, uh, white color uh, stuff is actually the genomic DNA. The, one of the classical uh, feature of genomic DNA is that it is very heavy, right? So it will not run very fast. It is actually going to be remain very close to the well. So the genomic DNA present in the aqueous phase is again precipitated with the absolute alcohol and the genomic DNA is analyzed onto the 0.8% agarose gel and a good preparation of DNA to make a given intact band with the no visible smear. Now, once you isolated the genomic DNA, you can be able to do many things. You can do the, as I said, you know, you can do the annealing temperature curve, you can do the GC versus AT ratio calculations, you can do even to know the sequence of the basis. How you can do the sequence of the basis? So how you know that what are the sequence of the nucleotides, right? So for that, you have to put the DNA into the DNA sequencing reactions. Let's understand about the DNA sequencing reactions. Now, once you, if you want to do the DNA sequencing, for example, if you, this is the DNA, what you have, and you want to do the sequencing, you have the two options. So historically, there are two op methods of the DNA sequencing with a similar principle of the breaking the DNA. So first you have to do is you have to first, because you know, it's not going to be single standard DNA, it's going to be a double standard DNA. So first you have to break the DNA either by the chemical method or the enzymatic method into the small fragments and followed by the separation and analysis into a high resolution electrophoresis gel. So you have the two method. One, you are going to break this into the two parts. So for example, if you have a complete genomic DNA, right? First you have to do is first you have to, you know, break the DNA and then you get the small fragments. And then in the method one, you can amplify this with the help of the PCR. And while you are doing the amplifications, you can use the modified basis. So when you do a modified basis, those at those base site, it is actually going to uh, not going to amplify beyond that. And that's how you are actually going to do the sequencing. And that method is called as the Sanger sequencing method. In other method, what you can do is you can do the base specific chemicals. So they are actually going to do the cleavage. For example, you can have the base specific cleavage for A, T, G and C and that's how it is actually going to break the DNA accordingly. So if you use that, then you are actually going to analyze them on a high resolution electrophoresis gel. Then you are going to get the many fragments and those fragments, if you do the analysis of those fragments, it is actually going to give you the sequence of the, that particular genome, uh, genomic DNA. 
that method is called as the maxim gilbert method so if you use the modified basis the 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 method is called as the sanger sequencing method if you use the chemical cleavage method then it is called as the maxim gilbert method so what is the uh, sanger's method or the di deoxy chain termination methods so the this method is originally been, de been developed by the frederick sanger in 1977 and for this method the frederick sanger is got the nobel prize right uh, for uh, you know for discovering a method to se sequence the genomic dna or the dna in this method a single stranded dna is used as a template to synthesize the complementary copy with the help of a polymerase in the presence of the nucleotides the polymerization reaction contains a primer and the nucleotide the three normal uh, nucleotide and the another one is a mod uh, modified uh, nucleotide which is called as the 2.35 uh, triphosphate uh when the dna polymerase utilizes the ddnps as nucleotide it get incorporated into the growing chain but the chain elongation stop at the ddnps due to the absence of the 3 prime hydroxyl group in the typical sequencing reactions the four different ddnps are taken into the four separate reactions and analyzed on to the high resolution polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis the ratio of the ntp and dntp is adjusted so that the chain termination occur at the each position of the base in the template so what you are going to do is if you want to do the di deoxy or the sanger's method first is that you are actually going to take the dna and then you are actually going to synthesize the primer this primer you have to do the radio labeled so this primer has to be radio labeled so that you can be able to monitor the uh, you know so you can be able to visualize this at, uh, under the auto rotogram so a primer is added and annealed to the 3 prime of the dna template so first you add the primers and then the radio labeled atp is there to label the primers so you are going to use the labeled primer and then the polymerase reaction is divided into the four reactions so you are going to have the four reactions the reaction for a reaction for g reaction for c and reaction for t when you say a reaction which means all other nucleotides are going to be normal but it is actually going to have the ddnp which is actually going to be a same is true for g same is true for c same is for t so what you have is you are actually going to divide the reaction into four reactions a reactions where all other nucleotides are normal but it is actually going to have the ddf di deoxy atp actually similarly you are going to have the t reactions so it is going to have the di deoxy uh thymine triphosphate but it is actually going to have the all other three nucleotides normal same is true for the g reaction and same is for the c reaction so if you perform all these what you will happen is that wherever you have the a it is actually going to stop the growth of that uh, dna synthesis same is true for the t c and c and then what you do is you take these reactions and analyze on to the high resolution uh, uh high resolution uh, uh, gels this is what it is going to happen if this is the sequence what you are analyzing for the sequencing it is actually going to give you the a reactions t reaction g reaction and c reaction so what you see here is that all in the a reactions all the places where you have a right for example here you have a you have here a you have a here you have and then you don't have a right so it is actually going to terminate so it is actually going to give you the fragments like a a t t a a t t a g a like that so do you if you uh, if you analyze them onto the uh, into the polyacrylamide gels or high resolution gels similarly is, this is the t right so what will happen is that it is actually these are the a reactions and these are the t reactions and so on so what you have to do is you have to read these reactions into the reverse order so you have to rule like this then you have to do like this then you have to go like this then you have to go like this then you have to go like this and that right so so if you go by this you will go in the reverse directions and it's actually going to give you the uh, fragments right this is the fragment what is happened right because this is a g right it's a terminating at g then this is a right so it's terminating at a 
then you have C, this is C, then you have the G, then something like that. So, if you read this in a reverse directions, ultimately you are going to get the sequence of that particular genome, the DNA, right. Now, let us move on to the next method and next method is called as the Maxim Gilbert method. This method was developed by the Ellen Maxer, Maxim and the Walter Gilbert in the 1977, which is based on the chemical modification and the subsequent cleavage. In this method, a 3 prime or the 5 prime labeled DNA is treated with the base pairing chemicals, base specific chemicals, which randomly cleave the DNA at their specific target nucleotides. These fragments are analyzed onto a high resolution polyacrylamide gel and a autoradiogram is developed. The fragments with the terminal radio label appear as a band in the gel. So, what you are going to do is you are going to do the reactions for the A, T, G and C. So, these are the four reactions you are going to do, right? You are going to do the reaction number one where you are actually going to add the dimethyl sulfate or DMS and that is actually going to modify the N7 of the guanine. So, that is it is going to be called as the G reaction. So, this reaction one is actually going to modify the guanine. Similarly, in, you have the reaction two where you are going to have the formic acid and that is actually going to attack the purine nucleotide. So, it is actually going to be called as G plus A reactions. Similarly, you have the reaction number 3 where you are going to use the hydrazine and that is actually going to break the pyrimidine and that is how it is actually going to be called as T plus C reactions and then subsequently you have the reaction 4 where in the presence of this salt NaCl, it breaks the ring of the cytosol and that is how it is called as the C reactions. After that, you have to do a cleavage reactions. After the base specific reactions, the piperidine is added which will replace the modified bases and catalyze the cleavage of the phosphodiester bond next to the modified bases and that is how it is actually going to give you the fragments. So, fragments which contains the G reactions, the fragment which contains G plus A reaction, the fragment which contains T plus C reactions and the fragment which contains the C reactions. So, if you analyze them onto a high resolution polyacrylamide gels, the pattern will look like this. So, you are going to have the G reactions, G plus A reaction, T C reaction and C reaction. So, if you started with this uh, DNA sequence, what you are going to get is you are going to get this, right. So, if you have the two bands which are very close to each other or of the same locations, then you are actually going to read the G, not the G plus A because it has already been um, present here. So, that is how you are going to read the G. Uh, the same fragment you see here is already also been uh, present again. Right? So, that is how you read the G plus A. Uh, so, you go actually in the reverse direction again just like as we have discussed in the Sagar's method. So, you go like this and if it is a T plus C and this, so then you are going to read the C first and then you are going to read this. So, that is how you if you go in this direction, if you go in the reverse direction, you are actually going to be end up with the sequence of the DNA fragment which you want to you know sequence in this particular reactions. So, this is all about the, uh, the sequence of sequencing of the DNA. Now, we are not going to discuss about the RNA because the RNA is also following the similar kind of structures. It also is made up of, of the nucleotides and it is a polynucleotide. The only difference between the RNA from the DNA is that the RNA is single standard whereas the DNA is double standard. So, when we talk about the RNA, the RNA could be of three different types. RNA could be the tRNA, right? So, this is the three different species of RNA. You have the tRNA, you have the messenger RNA and then you have the ribosomal RNA and all these three RNA species are extensively been involved into the protein synthesis uh, whereas um, where the uh, messenger RNA is actually going to carry the information from the DNA and where whereas the tRNA and the ribosomal RNA are actually going to interpret that information and that is how they are actually going to participate into the DNA synthesis. So, if you see a typical um, structure of the messenger RNA, what you see here is it has a 5 prime cap. This 5 prime cap is actually going to protect the RNA from getting the degradation by the 
um, riboses, ribo RNases, and all other kinds of degrading enzymes. Then we have the 5 prime UTRs. This 5 prime UTR is important for the uh, binding of the factors which are responsible for the uh, protein synthesis. And then this you are going to have the coding sequence. This is a sequence which is uh, going to be complementary to the D DNA sequence. So this this is the sequence what is being synthesized from the DNA. And then uh, then you are going to have the three prime UTRs. And then after that you are going to have the poly A tail. So this is the typical structure of the messenger RNA and since this has this kind of structure, it can be helpful in terms of the isolation of the messenger RNA from the cell. How are you going to isolate? First, the first step is that you are going to lyse the cells. Uh, we have already discussed this step uh, when we were discussing about the DNA. So you are going to homogenize if it is in, in the case of the tissue or the hard uh, material. Then what you are going to use is you are going to use a column which actually has the poly T beads. So poly T beads are nothing but a bead which actually has a strand and on this strand you are actually having the T nucleotides. So if you have a T nucleotide and you know that A is always making a base pairing with T, right? So that is how it is actually going to make the pair with T. So if you have this kind of strands, what will happen is that all the A what are present into the uh, RNA is actually going to bind this and that is how all the RNA what is present in that particular cell is actually going to bind these beads. And then the, you have the subsequent step, you are going to do the washing with the wash buffer and then you are going to do the elutions. And once you do the elutions, the RNA is going to be eluted and then you can collect the separate the beads from the eluent after the centrifugation and that is how it is actually going to give you the pure RNA. Once you got the pure RNA that you can use for many applications, you can use for the using it for the translation studies, you can use that for uh, preparation of the uh, cDNA libraries, you can use that for many other applications. So this is all about the nucleic acid what we have discussed. We have discussed about the structure of the DNA and we have also structure very briefly we have also discussed about the structure of RNA. Not only that we have also discussed about how you can be able to uh, sequence the nucleic acids. So we have discussed two methods. We have discussed about the Sanger's method and we have also discussed about the Maxim Gilbert method. We have a uh, detailed uh, lectures and all other aspects which are available on to the MOOCs courses. So if you are interested and you would like to discuss or study uh, these processes in detail, you can be able to go through the some of the other MOOCs courses for the uh, DNA synthesis and other kinds of prospects. So with this, I would like to conclude my lectures. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss uh, the other biomolecules what is present in the cell. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you.